President, fellows, guests. Kenneth and I are grateful for the chance to introduce you to our ongoing research into the famous late Roman silver hoard from Traprain Law. And we hope this evening to show you something of the value of returning to an apparently well-known find. We'll cover a variety of topics this evening with two particular foci of our research are the question of the role of such broken up silver vessels in the late Roman world and also what this can tell us about relationships across the frontier at this period. What about the site itself? Well, Traprain Law lies some 30 kilometres to the east of Edinburgh and it's a dominant hill in the low-lying East Lothian Plain. It's a hill with a complex history, and I'll touch on some of that later on, a very significant hill fort at this period. Most of our information about it comes from early 20th century excavations, and the key figure in these is A.O. Curl, Alexander Curl, director of the National Museum, one of the main figures in Scottish archeology span at this period, and at the time of the hoard's discovery, in May 1919, director of the excavations. Now, being director did not, of course, mean he was in sight every day. The actual work was done by a series of workmen, who you see here. And I'd like to use Curl's words from his diary to give you some flavour of the discovery. On Monday evening, after I had left the museum, a telephone message was received to say that Pringle had found something. I could not go in the morning, but I lunched in town and got the 140 train. It was a glorious afternoon, and I strolled up leisurely to the hill, taking a photo here and there as I went, not expecting that Pringle's find was anything of importance. And I should say, these photographs I'm showing you are from Curl's album, the photographs he took on the day. Imagine my surprise on reaching the site of the digging to see, ranged against the bank at the edge, a great collection of what appeared to be strange, battered and broken vessels of silver, much tarnished, though in places still bright, and even gilded. Between two stones lay a mass of silver objects. As it was impossible to carry the loot to East Linton, I sent Johnny in to order the car, and Pringle and Young helped me to carry them down, carry down the three boxes in my bag to the roadside. I decided to motor direct to Edinburgh in order to avoid the scrutiny at the train station. <laughs> Unfortunately, the local car was engaged, so for an hour and three quarters I guarded my boxes. The only people who passed were a minister and wife in a dog cart. They stared inquisitively while I glowered arrogantly till they averted their glances. <laughs> it gives us some sense of Carl the man, but I think also of the excitement of the discovery. And he goes on to describe his initial interpretation of it. Carl was a tremendous scholar, and within four years he had produced a work which remains fundamental to the study of the hoard and which was a tremendous step forward in the study of late Roman silver. It's a work we still consult today. So why are we looking at it again? Well, the amount of late Roman silver known has more than doubled since Curl's day. Not only that, but perspectives have changed on the nature of the late Roman world and its relationship to its neighbours. So Kenneth and I felt the time was ripe to look again at this major hoard. And we've been fortunate to persuade a range of colleagues from across Europe to help us on this task. And they are listed here on the slide below. And we draw very heavily on their work here. We also, on the occasion of the 90th anniversary of its discovery, had a seminar in Edinburgh where we brought scholars to discuss the top topic of hack silver, this, this hack top late roll. The results from this hack of this Carol focused very much on the vessels. Our approach is much more looking at the life cycle of the treasure, from its production and its use as vessels through various phases we suspect of the hacking into fragments and the movement of these through various parts of the empire and beyond. 
Their ultimate fate is either into the melting pot or into the ground. And this evening Kenneth will speak about the, the role as vessels and something of the phenomenon of hacking, and I shall return at the end to say a little bit about the site context and the deposition. But on that I turn over to Kenneth. Evening. The treasure consisted of more than 150 pieces of silver weighing about 24 kilos. They're almost all in fragments, although a few small vessels were not divided. More than 90 original vessels have been identified. 50 bowls are represented with 28 circular or square dishes, 10 jugs or flasks, 5 cylindrical vessels, 9 spoons and 28 other items. In addition, there are four coins, eight small folded parcels, and what Curl called Teutonic ornaments, which are actually fragments of military equipment and personal ornaments. Some small pieces can represent very large objects. The two fragments of rim on the right come from a large dish which was 70 centimetres in diameter, and the reconstruction gives an idea of how impressive it was. Such large dishes are rare and don't occur until the first part of the 5th century. Some pieces are unmatched in surviving silver. The fragments on the right, for example, are from the outer wall of a small bucket-shaped vessel. It has a flat base and a cagework wall, and the inner wall was of glass. The network is copied from the decoration of glass vessels, such as that on the lower half of the bucket now in the treasury of St. Mark's in Venice. The only hint of date is from the detailed shape of the network and the closest parallels are of the fourth, first quarter of the, of the fourth century. The decoration of the other objects ranged across the whole repertoire of late Roman silver. Of the figured scenes, for example, some were traditionally pagan, but the jug on the right is the earliest silver vessel showing figured Christian scenes. In the centre is the Adoration of the Magi, and to left and right are Adam and Eve and Moses in the wilderness striking water from the rock for the people of Israel. One scene is damaged, but it may be a second scene showing Moses in the wilderness feeding the people with quails in the morning and with, with manna in the evening. The earliest object is this dish uh, with a fluted rim. The type was in fashion at the end of the third century and the beginning of the fourth, like the parallels on the screen. The latest vessels in the treasure are represented by dishes and jugs like this one. The big divine or human figures which cover their surfaces in relief are typical of the first half of the fifth century. The source of the table where was dining services of the fourth and early fifth centuries in the, in the Western Empire. One example is the treasure from Kaiser August, buried in 352 at a late Roman fortress on the Rhine upstream from Basel. The Trier treasure, buried in the first half of the 5th century, was found in 1628. Unfortunately, it was melted down, but we have a contemporary inventory with weight, shapes and decoration. The silver in the Traprain treasure comes from big treasures of that sort but it also differs from them in that it includes a very much, larger, very much larger numbers of some categories of vessels. The fluted wash bowls, for example, normally, normally occur as singletons in hordes. So fragments of six from Traprain Law, of which you see four here on the right, suggest that the contents of the treasure come from at least six services. After which the treasure is given by the four silver siliquai, and, and the plate. The coins, which you see here, were all struck in the Western Empire in the last quarter of the 4th century, the later two of them between 397 and 402. Similarly, but less precisely, the tableware seems, when complete, not to have been later than the first several decades of the 5th century, but a more precise date for the deposit of the hoard is at present not possible. The coins also show where the treasure may have come from. <coughs> Siliquai were introduced about 350 and were struck in cities where an emperor and a court were in residence. 
but from the, free, from the 360s, some coins in Britain, and only in Britain, including the four from Traprain, were clipped, and the semi-official practice continued into the 5th century. Peter Guest's illustration at the top of the screen shows the variation in degree to which siliquai from the Hoxon hoard were clipped, and it also demonstrates how great care was taken to avoid the imperial image. The clippings were used to create Romani British copies of siliquai of good silver when regular siliquai were in short supply. As the map shows, there are very great numbers of clipped siliquai within the province of Britain, mostly south and east of the Fosway. In Scotland, however, there are very few clipped siliquai. Those from Traprain Law, therefore, are most likely to have come from the southeastern half of the province. This is also the best indication we have of the origin of the hack silver, but it does assume that the siliquai and the hack silver reach Traprain Law together, which is not certain. 150 so objects in the treasure, then, represent more than, more than 90 original vessels, together with a small number of personal or ornaments and four coins. The vessels range in date from the late 3rd century to the early 5th, and the clipped siliquai came from Britain and may indicate the immediate source of the plate and other objects. The other major question to be considered is why most of the objects in the Traprain Law treasure are hack silver. In other words, deliberately broken up or folded or crushed. The map shows that there's a good deal of hack silver inside the empire as well as outside its frontiers. In 1923, Curl cited only one other hack silver hoard from Coleraine in Northern Ireland. Now, however, we have a list of at least 48 finds of hack silver and they're not restricted to the Barbaricum. That's the, the territory between the Rhine and the Elbe and the Danube. Twenty or more of these finds are from inside the empire, particularly the provinces of Germany, Gaul, and Britain. Within the empire, hack silver, uh, there is hack silver from as early as the second century. The dish on the left, which must be from the Roman frontier in Bavaria, is dated by its style and the inscription to the early second century. Second century hack silver has also been identified in Britain before hacks fragments of two brooches are from Church Minzel in Cheshire. Third century finds of hack silver are known from France, Germany and Britain. This fragment from a dish from Ratley in Warwickshire weighs two thirds of a Roman pound, was cut into a shape like a slice of cake and was folded. In the 4th and early 5th centuries, there's a wide range of hack silver from Switzerland, Belgium, Spain, Italy, Britain, and Ireland. One of the most spectacular pieces is the dish found near Merida, presented to a high-ranking soldier or official by Theodosius in 388. At the time when it was hidden, it had already been divided into two and would have been further divided, as is shown by the fragments of a very similar dish from Gross Bodungen outside the frontier in Germany. Outside the empire, hack silver comes mostly from an arc of territory from Holland to Denmark, North Germany, and territory which is now in Poland. Seventeen of these finds come from Denmark. The example on the screen is 9.68 kilos uh, of hack silver from Simmerstead in Jutland with fragments of Roman silver of the 2nd and 3rd centuries and coins dating the deposit to not before the 5th century. In central Germany, however, we lack evidence for hack silver hoards in large parts of the territory between the Rhine and the Elbe. Hack silver is very rare in settlements, and although there's growing evidence of workshops producing fine metalwork, the scrap from them shows that the main source of raw silver was divided or melted denarii. What I've stressed so far is the number of finds of hack silver and their occurrence inside as well as outside the frontiers. So what does, does the evidence tell about where hack silver was created? Cur the find was known to him, believed that barbarians from outside the frontier seized silver from churches, temples, and great houses, and then took it home, broke it up, and shared it out. His view has persisted. The most important finds of 3rd century hack silver from Germany are from the bed of the Old Rhine, 14 pieces at Neuparts and 8 pieces at Hagenbach. In 2006, a reassessment of the finds interpreted the cutting up of this silver, creating hack silver, as evidence of division of booty by barbarians. In other words, groups of Alemanni, who had raided deep into Gaul, shared out their booty, 
before they ventured onto the waters of the Rhine on the, re on the return to their homeland. This view doesn't work. Of 14 pieces of hack silver from Neuputz, Fraser has shown that eight are excellent or possible matches for Roman weights, and such weights with the deliberately cut, sh uh, cut shapes show that fragmentation was not a random, savage act. The two kilos of silver from the Rhine was looted from Gaul in that form, just like the other 700 or more kilos of metal in the fine, 70% of which was iron. This supports a general conclusion that the distribution evidence and the broad spread of dates inside the empire imply that the empire looks more and more like the primary source. So why were silver plates and other objects hacked? Within the empire, the coinage, especially the silver coinage, was in crisis with a particularly low point in 195 when Septimius Severus doubled the pay of the army but halved the silver content of the denarii. This meant that alternative methods of exchange in precious metals, whether for, for commerce or gifts, had to play a growing role, and this was primarily a matter for the government. Gold and silver were used more and more in uncoined form. As part of, the po of this policy, the purity of silver ingots and plates was maintained uh, for the most part, at 96% or more, and weights were strictly controlled. The Constanz dish from Kaiser Augs, therefore, and other objects like it, which can be seen on the manuscript, were a vital part of the payment of soldiers and officials. In severe economic or political conditions, however, the authorities wishing to produce their natives were sometimes pressed for time, or for raw silver, or for stocks of fine plate, or for craftsmen capable of producing it. Hack silver, therefore, could play a part. There's again evidence in the Kaiser Augs treasure. In 350, Constans was assassinated at Autun by Magnentius, whose own attempt to become emperor lasted from 350 to 353. Magnentius' difficulties in finding suitable gifts for his followers are confirmed by the contents of 20 hoards deposited by his supporters across Europe, from Hungary to Britain. The Kaiser Augs treasure is one of these. From the donatives in the hoard, we know that the final owner changed sides from Constance to Magnentius, and from him he received donatives of three ingots, including a hacked ingot, and a hacked silver portion of a hemispherical dish, but no whole vessels and no coins. The rest of the hoards left by Magnentius supporters include gold coins and ingots, and one of them from Walter Newton in Cambridgeshire, which you see at bottom right, has two pieces of hack silver weighing one and two pounds, clearly standing in for ingots. But none of these finds included unhacked silver plate. A similar situation arose in 383, when Magnus Maximus, the commander of Britain, rose in revolt against the emperor Gratian. We know from historical sources that he levied a summary tax of money and precious metals from the whole population of the province to pay for his campaigns and that silver vessels which were collected were broken up and weighed to supplement the available coin. It is not the case, however, that all hack silver was produced by the authorities. Silver as bullion was used in private circles, and such silver did not always have to be in the form of complete objects. In the late 4th and 5th and 6th centuries, the rich were advised to break up their family silver and sell it for the weight of the metal in order to help the poor or to ransom prisoners, and Augustine ordered that the same thing should be done com with communion silver. And hacked silver could also be part of the lives of, of those who were not necessarily powerful or rich. The second century hoard of jewellery from Snettisham included silver ingots and scrap silver and gold, or used by the craftsmen who owned the hoard in just the same way that the fragmentary silver objects from patching in Sussex could have been used for repairs or exchange or just like the irregular hack silver in the West Bag Board. The same use objects can be seen outside the frontiers throughout the Roman Iron Age and migration periods. Complete Roman silver vessels, like other luxuries such as glass vessels, were popular with Germanic chiefs from the first century onwards, and from the second to the third century in particular, large quantities of gold and silver came into the hands of the elites of central Germany through what's been called a climate of cooperation and confrontation with the Roman Empire. Imperial donatives, for example, such as gold medallions, 
were gifts from the emperor which circulated for a long period and held in high regard, as is shown by the fact that they were carefully transformed into pendants. The medallion on the screen is one of 14 from a treasure of two and a half kilos of gold found in Romania. It's one of seven presented by the Emperor Valens in about the 370s to a leader of the Gepids. The map shows that most such medallions have been found outside the frontiers. Silver dishes were also prized outside the empire. The three from Kerch in the Crimea were given to barbarian officers by Constantius II in 357. Loops on the back show that they were displayed for the sake of prestige. No attempt was made to hack them. It's obvious, of course, that there was also hacked silver outside the frontiers, like the fragmented vessels from Grossbodungen on the left. But where were they hacked? It might have been outside the empire, but there was no large supply of silver plate in the Barbaricum as there was inside the frontiers, nor would there have been a ready supply of craftsmen practiced in the precise division of such objects. They are likely, therefore, to have been cut up inside the frontiers and to have been donated and, and for display from Constantine III in 407 to 11, just like the gold solidi in the find received from the previous emperors, such as Magnentius, Valentinian, and Theodosius. But hack silver was not only for display. How then was it used outside the frontiers? As with finds inside the frontier, exchange is one possibility but it's easier to establish this for the smaller pieces because the larger pieces, like denarii, were a means of storing wealth, but too large for everyday transactions. Recent finds from Denmark offer a clue. One of the few finds that seems conclusive is part of the enormous quantity of weapons and personal belongings found at Needham in 1990. Among them was a group of 23 tiny fragments of hack silver weighing only about 63 grams. They were tightly packed in one spot because they'd been in a leather or textile purse carried around by one individual, which were either valuables ready for exchange or a store of metal, uh, a store of metal to repair or decorate military equipment. Another example was found in the farmstead at Frau de Kierbe on Funen. They weighed 196 grams and included the solidus of Theodosius and fragments of Roman silver tableware, local jewelry and ingots. They might have been used by a craftsman, but the presence of other pieces of hack silver on the site hinted exchange. Both functions, both functions could coexist. Part of the trap rain law treasure might be, of, might be silver of this sort. The packets of silver on the, on the left, top left, are in the state in which they were found, and two of these contain fragments of pewter, which can only mean that the packets were intended to be a particular weight. Significantly, as Anne-Marie Kaufmann Heinemann has shown, they and the fragmentary spoons correspond to a Roman ounce or to fractions of it. On the rest of the site, on the other hand, hack silver does not seem to have played an economic role of this sort. Single pieces, which might have been used commercially, like coins, have not been found. In explaining hack silver, a number of Scottish Alexander Borsha attribute greater weight to political acts, such as the payment of tribute, the taking of booty, the giving and receiving of gifts, resulting in an accumulation of treasure which enhanced the importance of the donors or owners. A Danish treasure from Gudne Bjornabanken, for example, was found under the floor of a small wooden building in a farm complex. It consists of about 360 small fragments of at least two silver plates. Fragments of silver of Scandinavian gold jewellery date the burial to not earlier than the beginning of the 5th century, but four mid-4th century solidi are of the same date as one of the plates, which strongly resembles the Constans dish in the Kaiserreich's treasure. The absence of any haxum suggests that the plate and solidi came into the area on the same occasion that they might be the starting point of the assembly of a dynastic family treasure in the 350s. So hack silver could result from donatives received from service in the late Roman army, or it could represent a political settlement. There's no clear evidence that it was the product of plundering, nor that it was the result of exchange in an economic sense. 
Once the Haxil boat moved beyond the imperial frontiers, it could additionally have moved between barbarian leaders within their own exchange networks. I've been stressing the great range of hack silver across the Roman and Germanic worlds. In addition, however, we need to consider not just where it's found, but also where it's not found. Andreas Rao has noted that there's no hack silver in regions such as the Frankish area on the Lower or Middle Rhine, the Saxon area on the German North Sea coast, and the Alemannic areas adjacent to the Upper Rhine. His tentative answer to the problem is that the Roman administration had a direct relationship with these areas and that hack silver hordes, I quote, are typical of those regions which lay just outside the zone of direct influence of late Roman civilization in the sense of economic, military, and continuous interpersonal relations. But why this should be so is difficult to understand, and such solutions don't seem to fit the circumstances of late Roman trapperine law. There was no military presence in the area, probably because the Votadini formed a client kingdom, and this is reflected in the wealth of Roman finds of the site. Thus, on Rao's analysis, hack silver ought not to have been present. Perhaps, therefore, it's a mistake to assume, a mistake to assume that the silver was hacked for social and economic reasons. An alternative approach is to go back to the material, which in the case of trapper in law treasure is hacked Roman silver deposited with clipped siliquai. There are four other hoards which contain similarly, uh, similar hack silver and siliquai. Three are from Denmark, from Hurstentorp, Simmersted, and Hergsbrogard. The fourth horde is from Balin Rees, in North, uh, or Coleraine, in Northern Ireland. The clip siliquai showed that the treasures originated in Britain, and all except one were deposited in the early part of the 5th century. The exception, the Hurstentorp treasure, which must also have been assembled in the early 5th century, even though the Scandinavian metalworks Type, uh, type showed that the hoard was not deposited before the 6th century. <clears throat> the limited distribution in Denmark, Scotland and Northern Ireland is reminiscent of the natives studied recently by Martin Gugesberg. Comparison over a wide area showed that types do not, do not occur evenly or even randomly, but in restricted areas. Thus gold medallions are not found in northern Germany and the Baltic states, most probably because they were not given to local elites from there in the first place. To take a positive view, therefore, hacks over hordes with silica may very well have been presented to tribal leaders from Northern Ireland, Scotland, and Denmark by a donor who had used their services somewhere in the region. An obvious possible scenario <clears throat> is that the tribal ser uh, services were to the usurper Constantine III in the years 407 to 11, who in a four-year campaign in Gaul and Spain attempted to reverse the disastrous German invasion which began with the crossing of the Rhine in 406. Silver for coinage was in very short supply and so it would have been natural for him, like Magnentius in the middle of the fourth century, to resort to the same financial devices, to confiscate from Britain all the plate and coin he could and to pay his forces with chopped up plate and clipped siliquai. This then is a possible explanation of how the silica and hack silver went to Denmark and to Ireland from Britain during the 5th century. To conclude my part, the silver from Trapper in Law is extending greatly our knowledge of silver plate in the late Roman Empire. The hacking of such plate was not a random process and, and has its origins inside the Roman frontiers. Precious metal was always the priority, not the objects into which gold and silver were made. In the barbarian world, hack silver was received as a result of interaction with the Roman world, whether that involved service in the Roman army or the conduct of diplomacy or on occasion exchange. Equally, of course, the treasure is of great importance for the history of Traprain law and of the late Roman uh, Iron Age and early historic Scotland. Well, it's to this local thing that I'd like to turn. Look at how Traprain operated within a North British context and to say a little bit about this great hill on the edge of the empire. Recent excavations um, by my colleagues Ian Arbe, Tanja Dunmill and myself have helped to clarify, expand and confirm our existing picture of this site. 
And it's now clear that the history of Tripreen is episodic, changes a great deal over the millennia. The first major settlement is in the late Bronze Age, and this is when the first defences are built as well. So around about 1000 to 700 BC or so, we see the first major activity on the site. But for most of the Iron Age, it seems the hill is abandoned. The defences are, uh, new defences are constructed, old defences are maintained to a degree, but there is minimal settlement on the site. The hill is perhaps a place to which people come on high days and holy days. It's not a place for permanent settlement. This changes again in the centuries of the Roman Iron Age, 1st to 4th centuries AD, when the hill is a boom town. And we see enormous quantities of material and large amounts of settlement evidence from the hill. Although the defences themselves have fallen from use. The hill is, if you like, unenclosed. They are using an old site, hallowed by history, but not enclosing it within a new set of defences. The precise dating is difficult, but it's sometime in the first century AD, and it's very tempting to see this boom and this centralization as connected to the arrival of the Romans on the scene. That we're seeing here perhaps the first steps of the creation of a client kingdom in southeast Scotland. And if we were looking for parallels, we might look at sites like Stanick in North Yorkshire which although in the flatlands rather than on a hill, similarly has a wide range of Roman imports, a wide range of craft material as well. But whereas Stanek is a short-lived phenomenon, Traprain remains a centre in East Lothian for over four centuries, with a wealth of material coming off it. There are more Roman finds from Traprain law than from the rest of Iron Age Scotland put together. And perhaps the most significant element is when the Romans finally pull out of Scotland, when Hadrian's Wall is established as the final frontier in the 3rd and 4th centuries, Traprain continues to have strong links to the empire. This is the period of the treasure, of course, and it's also around this time, late 4th, 5th century, that the hill is refortified. The line in blue shows a last fortification of the site. Now again, the hill is densely occupied. Our recent excavations have shown that every scrap of land that isn't bare rock has got a building on it. And the work of the late Ian Smith was able to clarify the setting of the hoard tremendously, teasing together excavation plans generated over several years to suggest that there was at least two phases in this late level and that the hoard sat within a yard complex here, with what may well be a roundhouse here, and a scattering, a yard surface round about it. On that basis, the hoard is buried in a domestic context, in a living site, but it's also not the final act on this site. It seems there is material uh, and structures built later than this. In other words, it's not connected to the abandonment, although the reasons for its burial remain sadly opaque. The silver is only one element of these contacts to the late Roman world. I, I could show you a variety of things. I shall restrict myself to the glassware. Now, of course, because it's a settlement site, the material is fragmentary. But it doesn't take much imagination to see the quality of the glass cup on the right-hand side with this very fine line engraving. And Professor Jenny Price has suggested this in itself could well be seen as some form of diplomatic gift or political gift exchange. The object on the left from our own excavations is initially much less impressive, but enough survives to indicate that it comes from something like this, a claw beaker or a similar kind of bag-shaped vessel. Um, some of the most desirable objects in the late 4th and 5th century um, in both Roman and barbarian hands. So this was a well-connected site. There's a whole series of links into the Roman world. The silver is only one part of that. And it includes also traces of service in the Roman army. Argument can has been out. Brooches, strap ends and buckles, typical of late Roman military belt sets. There are people on this hill who have been serving in the army or who have very strong connections with the army. But what's the nature 
of this contact to the late Roman world. Well, if we look at the distribution of material, we see some very clear patterns, and in particular, we see clusters and gaps. The most notable gap is this area here, the northeast of Scotland. And this is the heartland of the Picts, the bad boys of the late Roman frontier, if you like. And much of the um, historical sources of particularly the 4th century are devoted to bemoaning how awful the Picts are being. The Picts overrunning various elements of the frontier and so on. What to me the distribution suggests is a deliberate policy, a policy whereby Pict land is avoided in terms of contacts and there's clusters instead in other areas. Essentially a policy of trying to build a buffer between the late Roman frontier and the nasty boys to the north. You'll see also a cluster up here in northern Scotland which could be seen if you like as a flanking manoeuvre. Now the stars represent the major hill forts at this period with late Roman finds and these I suspect are Traprain type sites. Underneath Edinburgh Castle, now sadly disfigured by a nasty medieval monstrosity, there must lie a lovely late Iron Age site, I suspect. And the finds coming off that would suggest this is a major late Roman contact point. But you'll see a very strong clustering in eastern Scotland defined by the red line. And Traprain Law sits in the heart of this. And this looks to me like deliberate targeting of the Tweed Valley and East Lothian to create this buffer up the east coast. Interestingly, at the other end of the wall, recent work has identified a similar cluster, or rather, recent re-identification of old finds. The brooch to the right from Eric Stainbury is a, a imperial gift from Diocletian himself in the early 4th century, and the other two coins, uh, the other two finds recently identified from antiquarian sources, all clustering within this area of Dumfriesshire. A uniface gold medallion, exactly the kind of thing being given as gifts to other barbarian leaders, or this curious gold bracelet or armlet, which again seems to fit into a late Roman habit of gift giving. So here we see a cluster of material being given to a powerful polity at the western end of the wall. Another attempt to build a buffer between the wall and the groups to the north. With the silver, though, what use was all this material? Well, whereas finds like we see on the screen could be prestigious objects showing the, the pleasure and the hand of Rome, and likewise the glass, which we saw earlier, presumably functioned as an intact vessel at feasts and so forth, the silver was a commodity. It came to the site in fragments. Its destiny was the melting pot. And recent analysis at the museum has shown that a number of crucibles from the site show evidence of silver working. And this is the earliest evidence we have for silver working in Scotland. It really starts off as a 4th, 5th century phenomenon. So the silver is destined for the melting pot. But what are the products of it? Well, most likely things like these, these magnificent silver chains, wh whose dating is hotly debated, but they would fit readily into a 5th, 6th century context. And these are, if you like, an old status symbol reimagined. These are versions of torques, the neck ornament, so common in Iron Age societies to define status and power, reinvented in new times with a new material. So one of the values of this late Roman silver in these groups beyond the frontier is as a raw material which you can convert for your own purposes. And part of its lasting value is this wealth it gives to the societies of early medieval Scotland. This is material from the Pictish hoard of Norrie's Law in Fife, some 40 kilometres north of Traprain as the crow flies. And it includes masterpieces of Pictish art with typical Pictish symbols, such as the enigmatic plaque on the right. Now, it's long been recognised there are also elements of Roman silver in this hoard. At the bottom of the screen is a bent fragment of late Roman silver. And there were some clipped siliquai in this hoard as well. But reappraisal of this material by my colleagues Martin Goldberg, Alice Blackwell and Susie Kirk 
and particularly analysis of the silver, has shown there is other Roman silver within this. A number of these undiagnostic fragments here are analytically distinctive in terms of their purity compared to the distinctively Pictish material. And these seem to be pieces of late Roman plate not yet melted down. So in this, in the mixture of Roman and indigenous material, it's very, very similar to the Danish hordes which Kenneth was describing earlier. And I think this is an important part of this work. It's to see what's happening north of Hadrian's Wall in the wider context of what's happening beyond the Roman frontier. We don't need a specifically Scottish explanation for this. It ties into much wider patterns and policies. I shall finish with something of the story of what happened after the discovery. And here I'm drawing very heavily on the work of my colleague George Dalgleish. Because there's a very interesting afterlife to the hoard. The conservation work was more than the museum could handle. And it was subcontracted to Brook and Son of George Street in Edinburgh. Goldsmiths to the king, as they proudly proclaimed. And by a series of procedures that keep me awake at night when I think about them, they reshaped our bent and broken fragments into the vessels you can see today. Conservation techniques, restoration techniques, we wouldn't dream of today, although in a sense, thank goodness they did it, because it gives you a sense of the, the appearance of these things. Well, Brook and Son also came to an agreement, an arrangement with the museum um, over the afterlife of this material, and they constructed a series of both reconstructions and restorations of these finds. Some very similar, some restored from fragments, which they sold both as sets and as individuals. And these became highly desirable in the Edinburgh social scene of the 20s and 30s. As wedding gifts, for example, they were regular. And consultation of the, the records of the incorporation of goldsmiths suggests thousands of these vessels were being produced. Indeed, you can still buy them today. There was one sold, I think it was at Sotheby's about 10 years ago, one of the flatter platters, although it was advertised as a haggis platter, so I suspect they hadn't, <laughs> they hadn't entirely understood its significance, I suspect. And some of this material was modified for the taste of the 20s and 30s, so here we see the dolphin-handled spoon, and above it, it's been converted into a tea strainer. So turned into, turned into a, a modern life, if you like. And a number of these things were converted, for example, into cruets or salt and pepper sets. So we're seeing this material living an afterlife. Um, the initial agreement was that Brook and Son would make these replicas, um, and for the first um, 10 years, they would give a proportion of the money to the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, who had funded the excavation. And there's a wonderful letter in a file some 20 years after the event saying, can we stop paying the royalties now, please? So I think the society did rather well out of that. <laughs> to conclude, we are well aware that we are still in the foothills of our study. Although the first fruits of this have now been published, as the President mentioned, the seminar which looked at the wider issue of late Roman silver was published by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland um, in, in January of this year. And we think this, this is very useful to set the scene and put the wider context for how this material is operating. Our next task, of course, is to bring the wider study and republication of the hoard to a conclusion, something we're still working on. And we're very grateful to this society for a grant they provided last year towards illustration costs, which is a key element of what's still to be done. But we hope that we've been able to present at least some of the new views and the new problems which are being thrown up by our team's work on this great find. And we hope this is stimulating some new questions and some new ideas, not only on this hoard at the edge of the empire, but issues which we feel are relevant to the interpretation of the wider late Roman world and its relationship to its neighbours. Thank you very much. Rapid consultation over who will we'll talk about what. Um, I'll 
I suppose, look initially at the question of the analysis of the material um, and the issue of its reuse and turn also to the issue of its burial and in the wider context. The analysis which we've done um, has been twofold. One was taking a sample of material and uh, analysing it in the, the Pixie facility underneath the Louvre. And what this showed was a remarkable homogeneity within the material, within, among the material we sampled, very consistent with other late Roman material that has been sampled. We followed that up with a degree of surface analysis, um, which on the whole has backed up that information. But we still have some work to do, particularly in the personal ornaments, to see how that compares to some of the, the plate in the hoard. But at the moment, the results don't they look essentially like um, the other analyses, like Roman silver from sites like Hoxon, for example, or Kaiser Augs. That contrasts to a degree with the results from the um, post-Roman or late Roman Iron Age material. And what our working hypothesis at the moment is that we see the initial reuse of Roman silver in some of this material, things like the chains, represented by very, very high silver purities. So there are some of the chains which are at about 95% silver purity, which essentially is um, the purity of the late Roman plate, 95-98. You then see other of the chains show markedly lower silver levels, but the picture is complicated because you can get variation within the one chain. And we are at the moment trying to uh, undertake some further work to get beyond the problems which surface analysis alone has which is that the material can often be either depleted or enhanced on the surface, and see if we can use minimally destructive techniques to get a more reliable picture of the way the silver composition is varying. But for the chains, it's the purity of the silver, in some examples, that makes us argue for these being reused late Roman material. That, of course, in the absence of other, source, other sources of silver at this time, there's no evidence of Scottish silver being exploited so far until the 12th century. The Norris Law material similarly shows this mix between high purity material we would see as being Roman, and in some cases confirmed as Roman typologically, and the, the Pictish material, or the other material, some of which is typologically Pictish. So we're seeing, if you like, the dilution over the following century or two of the initial Roman material by other material coming in, um, essentially stretching this material with, with copper or with bronze and so on. The other main topic, um, I suppose from my area of expertise, which a couple of the questioners touched on, was this issue of burial. And it's really, although this is one of a, only a handful of excavated silver hoards, it was of course excavated a long time ago, and that limits the amount of information we can get from the immediate context. But the reading that I would have of the material is that it's buried inside this house context, in this domestic setting. The evidence is not, however, good enough to demonstrate whether it's buried while the settlement is in use, while the, that particular building is in use, or whether it's abandoned. Neither can we absolutely confirm how long after the, the treasure is brought together that it is buried. There's no evidence of activity on Traprain Law after the 6th century. So if you like, a terminus antiquem would be the 6th century. If you follow Ian Smith's argument that the treasure is buried in this house complex and there is then settlement over the top of that with these elongated buildings, that would be pushing the burial of the hoard perhaps closer to the latest dates of the material. But because it's not a modern excavation, we are always a little, we're going to be a little bit hidebound in what we're able to do. Our hands are rather tied. But it is buried in a domestic context. Now that does not, of course, mean it's necessarily a pragmatic deposit. And the question of whether it's intended as a votive deposit is a very good one, but a very difficult one to answer. The other hack silver hoard we know from Scotland, the Norrie's Law Hoard, to my mind is a votive deposit. It's buried beside, well, on the edge of, an older monument, an early, early Bronze Age burial cairn, overlooking the Firth of Forth. And this seems to be a place again hallowed by memory, which this significant deposit is placed in. And we can find other parallels for important hoards placed in earlier significant sites. With Traprain, it's more difficult. I would say it's, it's the classic Scottish verdict of not proven. I don't think we can say one way or the other, because you could construct either a pragmatic or a votive interpretation for the hoard. 
it's tempting to construct a pragmatic one because you've got um, about a point which I think we're in agreement on, I pointed out by Martin Gugesberg, one of our colleagues, it's interesting what a large amount of decorated material is present in the hoard and how little plain silver there is. The plain silver is far easier to recycle. It's not got gilding and yellow and things on it. So it may be they've, they've used the material which is easiest to use first of all, and what you're left with behind is almost some of the more difficult elements. So maybe th th this could easily be the cache of a metal worker which is intending to come back to at some point, but it could also as easily, be, to my mind, be an offering of the metal worker when they leave the site of, or towards the end of the site's activity. I fear, again, we're not going to be able to answer that. It would be easier if we had more examples to draw upon. And if we look at the, the Danish evidence, it, well, look at the Irish evidence, and both finds come from, from watery places, from peat bogs, classic votive locations, if you like. The Danish evidence is more complicated because a lot of that material, again, comes from settlement contexts, and it's unclear why it's being buried. So, as I say, not proven would be my, my get-out clause on that particular question. I think, I hope, Fraser's has answered all, or uh, most, if not, if not all of the questions. But Roger Land raised the problem, if I heard him correctly, of, um, of why there are quite a lot of um, silica in Britain uh, in connection with, with Hexilva, but not in Denmark. One reason, I think, is that the Danish hordes are at a different stage of their life cycle, as we are becoming tempted to call it, but it's later, and that's, uh, and therefore in the Danish hordes, you, you find um, pieces of, of um, native jewellery uh, uh, and so on. The, the, the silver has already been converted, um, and that may easily ac account for why, why there are fewer, why there appear to be fewer um, silica in those hordes. But it's not the case with every hoard. I think it's, it's either and or for Simmerstead, perhaps it's Simmerstead, which had something, I believe, like 2,000 coins in it. So it's not true of every Danish hoard that, that the number of, of, of silica are, are very small in number. Um, John Casey was uh, quite rightly chasing me about Magnus Maximus and the, 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 the way the... Uh, where we have this historical mention in, in, um, in a Roman panegyric uh, of, of, of Mag... So, sorry? It's, it's, it's a historical fact that we have a panegyric. <laughs> um, and we have a statement in the panegyric that Magnus Maximus had set up. And of course, Magnus Maximus is a baddie in that. So of course, his actions, uh, it, it could be understandable that his actions are, are that, that the motives for his actions are, are, are questioned. Nevertheless, I'm not going to abandon it as, as a quotation because it's almost the only one we've got which actually describes the process of, 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 of hacking. Uh, and it is a perfectly reasonable interpretation, I think, of, uh, of gloss on why silver plate might have been cut up um, 